How dogs enrich our lives. Can you imagine your life without a dog? For most dog owners, that's not a pleasant thought. Well, it's true that they take time, patience, and energy. Did I mention patience? They are worth whatever investment we put into them. Every day, they are with us. We find ourselves thankful for the way they touch our lives. Dogs come in different shapes, sizes, colors, and temperaments. You may think your dog always existed as he is today, but most dogs are the result of purposeful breeding of several varieties to obtain selective qualities. In fact, dogs are represented by over 400 breeds worldwide. Dogs have been bred to work, herd, protect, fight, and hunt. And there is, a and there is variation within each ability. Some dogs hunt by sight, others by scent, and some point out wild game while others flush birds. Another example of different abilities shows up in the way dogs manage livestock. Some herding dogs round up strays. Others run around the herd to control it, while some varieties stare down the biggest ram or bull. Matching the perfect dog, dog to a specific need not only gives you a beloved pet, but a very valuable asset that will enrich your life. And they touch our lives in many other ways. Arctic sled dogs often sleep with their masters to share warmth, while beagles can sniff out termites, a termite's presence in an infested house. Seizure alert dogs can warn their own owners of impending seizures. Dogs are used for search and rescue, sentry duty, helping the disabled, and detecting drugs or bombs. Their abilities are truly remarkable. In addition to evaluating specific characteristics, temperament is also unique to our dogs. Yes, personality assessment has now moved into the realm of canines. Incompatibility exists not just between humans, but between people and their dogs as well. They both share personality types. Bonnie Bergen's Guide to Bringing Out the Best in Your Dog contains a system based on social style. By using this system, it's possible to look at a dog and determine its personality type as either analytical, driver, amiable, or expressive. Which word describes your dog? In his book, Why We Love the Dogs We Do, Stanley Corin classifies dogs into seven different breed groups. Friendly, protective, independent, self-assured, consistent, steady, and clever. Going even further, he suggests dogs for ex extroverted and introverted people. There's much to learn about dogs, but if you own a dog, you already know how much it can benefit your life. Once a dog enters your heart, you are never the same again. A dog can, if you let it, teach you much about living as well as about yourself. Hopefully, what is contained in these pages will either remind you of the value of a dog or open your eyes to the delights of participating in life with a canine friend. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee. How to talk to your dog. Do you talk to your dog? Of course you do. All of us who own dogs engage in conversation with them. We greet our dogs when we arrive home and say goodbye when we leave. We ask them questions. Are you hungry? Or do you want to go for a walk? We even ask them questions they couldn't possibly answer. Should I wear this suit or go casual? Or do you think I'm going to stay warm or should I take a coat today? You're probably thinking, I don't do that. Really? 
listen to yourself for a while. You may be surprised. For most of us, our language changes under different circumstances. We talk differently in formal situations than with family and friends. There's a special kind of language we use in talking with children, as well as talking with dogs. We call this form of language doggerel. Dog doggerel. <laughs> it's true. It's different. Do you know how it's different? Think about this. With adults, we usually use 10 to 11 words per sentence, but with dogs, it's four. When you talk to your dog, about 90% of your conversation will be about the present. After all, why bring up the past with your dog or anyone else for that matter? Also, when you talk to your dog, you're 20 times more likely to repeat or rephrase statements than when talking to a person. Most of what we say to dogs is of a social nature rather than items of information. We also use higher tones, distort words and phrases to make them less formal and place more emphasis on tone of voice. And finally, we, yes, we as people, tend to mimic the sounds our dogs make. So when you catch yourself doing this, it's all right. You're a normal dog owner. Surviving puppyhood. What do puppies do? Puppies are great teachers. They teach you patience and consistency. They teach you to put things away, close doors, and never leave anything around you don't want chewed. They teach you to be on the alert, watch where you walk, and before they're even potty trained, never walk around the house barefoot. They teach you not to leave three dozen freshly baked cookies on the counter within reach of your puppy and then go outside for 20 minutes. If you do, he'll wolf it down. Ours did. That pile of flour, sugar, and chocolate chips that are toxic to dogs churned and fermented in his stomach all night. In the morning, the vet taught him the meaning of an enema. Not a pretty sight. Puppies frolic. They're mischievous and they chew. They should come into the world with a sign on them, born to chew. If it moves, chew it. If it doesn't move, chew it. If it's soft, hard, pliable, brittle, dull, or bright, chew it. Your Ethan Allen early American furniture could be modified to a new style, distressed. Remember the first Christmas with your puppy? Especially remember the tree ornaments and how they tended to disappear? Fortunately, the green Christmas tree light bulb that our golden retriever ate wasn't that expensive. Only 79 cents. It was much less expensive than his mistress's glasses he had chewed up two days before. It was that episode that helped me make the decision to take out a medical insurance policy on the pup. This little investment has paid off quite well. Remember that you'll survive puppyhood and its daily adventures and misadventures. We have time after time, including the episode with the shrinking garden hose. It wasn't that we had failed to buy a pre-shrunk ho hose. It was a nice, long, 50-foot hose. It started shrinking while we were away on vacation. A neighbor came over each day to feed our puppy and water the flowers. After the second day, he was a bit puzzled. After the third day, he was confused. He said, I could have sworn this hose was longer, but each day it seemed to be getting shorter. He was right. Every time he left, he also left the hose out. And as soon as the puppy saw it, he proceeded to chew off a six foot hunk of hose and take off with it. It became shorter and shorter until I just threw it away. 
I couldn't get upset at Sheffield, though. It wasn't his fault. He did what puppies are wired to do. If it's in sight, chew it up. That's the universal doggy rule. You can't change it, so don't try to fight it. Just put away the hose. You can stay. Last week, a friend called, saying he had a precious beagle puppy looking for a home. Say puppy to me, and I lose all reason. I saw a small, droopy-eared creature with big brown eyes that said, Love me. I didn't consider the headaches that come with new puppies. We'll take him, I heard myself say. Within 48 hours, he had deprived me of sleep with all-night whimpering, shredded the draperies, and made a disaster of the carpet. Suddenly, he didn't seem so precious. He fell more into the category of an Egyptian plague. What am I going to do with you? I said, staring into his brown and white face. He cocked his head at me. At once, those eyes seemed to say, love me. As I picked him up, I couldn't help but think how my experience with this pup was not so different from my interaction with people. Sometimes I reached out to them with a surge of emotion, but when I came in contact with their imperfections and discovered the nuisance side of their nature, I wanted to back away. Yet love, I reminded myself, meant taking the bad along with the good. The puppy licked my nose. All right, I told him, you can stay. The nose knows. Noses come in various sizes and shapes. Some are long and narrow, others are pug. Some seem to tilt up, others are plain and simple. But for some dog owners, a dog's nose can be a source of embarrassment. Not for the dog, but for them. It's true, dogs sniff, constantly. They're smelling here, there, and everywhere. They have no boundaries when it comes to sniffing and smelling. It's just what they do. I've heard people say to their dogs, stop sniffing there, stop it, I say. Why do you always have to sniff everyone? Now be a good dog. Have you said this? Have you heard it from others? Have you ever imagined what a dog would say in reply to this if it could understand all this verbiage? Perhaps it would go something like this. My name is George. I'm a dog. Sometimes I hear people say they were born to shop. Well, I was born to sniff. I sniff and smell my way through life. I laugh when people tell me to stop, stop sniffing every day. They might as well tell me to stop breathing or panting. I was created to smell everything, and I am good at it. Oh, yes, I am. Much better than humans. My sense of smell is at least a million times more acute than humans. Why is that, you ask? My nasal region is much larger than humans. I have 50 times the olfactory cells compared to humans. I am olfactory gifted. They're olfactory challenged. Sure, my nose can get me in trouble at times. I use smell like they do to gather information. I discover life through my nose. I have sniffing power. That's why I can't keep my nose out of the trash can. People read newspapers to bring themselves up to date on the local happenings. Well, so do we. Only we use our noses. When you take me on a walk, I have my favorite tree or hydrant. I go up and smell and think, aha, Rex has been here. So has Rosie. Sam and... <laughs> Hmm, I don't recognize that one. And there's Prince. Haven't smelled him for days. Glad he's still around. And I'll let them know I'm out today. And so I mark the spot too. It's the neighborhood doggy grapevine. 
It's my source of knowing who's around. So if you take me for a walk and you don't let me sniff all around, that's creating an SDCC or socially deprived challenged canine and otherwise known as doggy abuse. And remember, there are many other times when my nose is a lifesaver. How many lives have been saved by dogs alerting their masters to a fire in the house? We've joined the police force because of our ability to sniff out our drugs, to sniff out drugs. Some of us have been trained to follow the scent of a person for over a hundred miles. Others can catch the scent of a person underwater. Buried cadavers, people buried under the snow, and those covered under tons of rubble such as the Oklahoma City disaster and earthquakes. And I'm sure you know how much we are used to, used for tracking wild game and assisted hunt and assisting hunters. Yes, we dogs sniff a lot. Be thankful. Encourage us to do what we've been created to do. Who knows? Our sniffers may come in handy to help you. What do they know that we don't know? Or do dogs have more sense than we do? Do dogs think? What's going on in their minds as they lie there looking out the window or watching every move you make? Sure, the brain cells in a dog's brain work the same way ours do. And it's true that their brains contain most of the structures found in our brains. For example, vision is located at the back of the brain for both people and dogs. But what goes on inside that head of theirs? Is there any conscious thought? Is there any rational process occurring? When they sit there with their eyes glazed over, are they fantasizing about a juicy sizzling steak? A romp in the woods? Or leading you around with a leash and collar? When they sleep, dogs dream just like people. And little dog dreams more frequently, and little dogs, sorry, dream more, than, more frequently than big dogs. Do you ever wonder what's going on in your dog's mind when he's dreaming? You've seen a dog dream, haven't you? He falls asleep and his breathing becomes regular. His side moves gently up and down and then the dream begins. The breathing becomes shallow and irregular. Muscles twitch. Legs begin to quiver. Look closely and you'll see his eyes moving behind his closed eyelids. Then the sounds begin. Little yips mournful groans or growls, or even whining may make you wonder, what is going on in that dog's mind? I wish I could see a video of those dreams. Perhaps we'll never know the answers to our questions about a dog's mind, but there's one thing we know for sure. Most of a dog's brain is used to create as many applications and variations of the verb, let's eat, as possible. But now that I think about it, a lot of people I know are like that as well. Things we can learn from a dog. Never pass up the opportunity to go for a joy ride. Allow the experience of fresh air and the wind in your face to be pure ecstasy. When loved ones come home, always run to greet them. When it's in your best interest, practice obedience. Take naps and stretch before rising. Run, romp, and play daily. Eat with gusto and enthusiasm. Be loyal. Never pretend to be something you're not. If what you want lies buried, dig until you find it. When someone is having a bad day, be silent, sit close by, and nuzzle them gently. Thrive on attention and let people touch you. Avoid biting when a simple growl will do. 
on hot days, drink lots of water, and lay under a shady tree. When you're happy, dance around and wag your entire body. No matter how often you're scolded, don't buy into the guilt thing and pout. Run right back and make friends. Delight in the simple joy of a long walk. I am not impressed. Dogs aren't impressed by pedigrees. When a mutt meets a purebred with the name Amber Britches from the Royal House of Winslow, he's not impressed. He couldn't care less. He's not intimidated, nor does he behave differently. It just doesn't matter. It's no big deal. How unlike us. We get hung up on titles, prestige, power, position, status, and money. We're uncomfortable around some people because of all those so-called qualities. But not a dog. A dog simply doesn't have the hang-ups we humans have. Maybe it's good that he doesn't know how much he doesn't know. And even if he did know, it wouldn't matter if he knew. He accepts us for who we are regardless of our pedigree. What would it be like if we did the same? The average dog is a nicer person than the average person. Do you hear what they hear? Did you ever wish you could hear as well as your dog? Dogs can hear anything that has to do with food from three rooms away. And when you whisper to a family member, let's go for a walk by ourselves for a change, guess who appears in the blink of an eye? They are able to hear sounds at much higher tones than we do. Most people can't hear sounds above 20,000 cycles per second, but some dogs can hear them up to 45,000 cycles per second. Since small dogs have smaller ears and Renaissance amplifies high sounds, they can hear higher tones than big dogs. But big, square-headed dogs can hear subsonic sounds. These are low-frequency sounds you and I are unable to hear. This is why St. Bernard's can hear faint sounds made by those trapped under snow. Some dogs can hear the almost undetectable sounds of the start of an avalanche and give advance warning. So when your dog's ears go on alert, listen to what you can't hear. He could be telling you something. Confessions are good for the dog owner. It's time to fess up. It's time to get personal about you and your dog. There are certain questions that dog owners would probably like to avoid, but we're asking anyway. We won't share your answers with anyone. You don't have to either, unless you want to. But you could ask other dog owners these questions and put them on the spot. Now keep in mind the percentages of these answers are for way back when this book was published in 1999. But just think about it. It's probably more now. First, do you kiss your dog? That's right. Kiss your dog. Do you? It's okay. One research study showed that 63% of dog owners kiss their dogs. Do you allow your dog to kiss you? Only 51% 51, only 51 did. That surprises me. Let's look at the photos you have in your wallet or jump ahead to 2021. What about the photos you have in your cell phone? Would we find a picture of your dog there? It's okay. Market researcher Barry Sinrock found that 40% of those interviewed carry pictures of their dogs, 40% as of 1999. And that's 20 times more frequent than pictures of their mothers-in-law. 
Here's another revealing question. Do you ever talk to your dog over the phone or through your answering machine? Yes, that's right, the phone. Well, a third of those dog owners interviewed have admitted to doing this. Did your dog fail obedience school or drop out? Of those that attended, 33% did. Have you ever called your spouse by your dog's name? 38% fess up to doing this. And worse yet, 25% said they called their dog by their spouse's name. <laughs> Guess who ended up in the doghouse that day? Have you ever dressed up your dog with something like a scarf or ribbon? 86% say yes. And finally, is your dog named as a beneficiary in your will? If so, you're right up there with an estimated 1 million Americans who have done the same. The only problem is that in most states, pets cannot be left money or property in a will. Yes, if we are honest, we must admit to being, at times, a little foolish when it comes to our pets. But we can't help it. We love them. Somehow they cease to be animals and become instead treasured friends. No wonder we lavish affection and silliness upon them. Dogs are not our whole life, but they make our lives whole. Sounds you don't want to hear from your dog. Dogs vary in the sounds they make. Just go to a kennel or a local humane society shelter and listen. Most of the dogs are barking, but it sounds like the United Nations of dogs with a wide variety of expressions. You will hear whining, yipping in various octaves, light barking, intense barking, frantic crying, fierce growling, you name it, you'll hear it. In your home, you'll also hear a variety of sounds. Some dogs howl, others sing, most burp, and they all seem to sigh. They speak to get your attention, to warn you, to tell you they're hungry, to tell you they need to go out, to irritate you, and for no good reason at all. All of these you accept. You get used to them, but there are certain sounds you don't want to hear from your dog, such as the door of the refrigerator popping open at 2 a.m. If this happens, your dog's been watching too many commercials or perhaps he's been watching you. The sound of teeth being sharpened on wood, but you don't have any old lumber around your house. Don't worry, those indentations on the leg of the table or the piano bench can be filled with wood putty. No one ought to notice them. If they do, simply smile and say, it's the newest doggy decor. The sound of the lapping of water as your dog drinks on and on from his water dish. Only you're sitting there looking at his water dish. Then it hits you. As you rush into the bathroom, his head lifts from the toilet bowl water streaming off his chin and he sees and he sees your look of disgust and hands on your hips he stares at you looking dumb and his look says hey i'm a dog what did you expect when you don't put the lid down the worst is no sound at all silence you don't want to hear silence your dog usually isn't silent unless you fill it in. You know what trouble he's into now. He comforts me. A study of a twice weekly dog visitation program in rest homes showed significant decreases in depression, anxiety, and confusion. Of 1,000 elderly members of a Los Angeles health maintenance organization, those who own dogs sought medical care 20% less often than people without a pet. Animals give unconditional acceptance. They listen to the same story again and again, just as though it was the first time. 
Your heart rate tends to be lower when you sit quietly or read aloud in the presence of a friendly dog than when you do it alone. The survival rate for heart surgery patients is higher for those who have dogs in their home than for those who don't. Those who own dogs tolerate stress better and have lower cholesterol and blood pressure levels. A study showed dogs were actually a better source of social support than spouses. 240 people participated in a stress study which showed that the participants' stress response was highest when spouses were present and lower when only their pets were there. Why? Well, it's probably because dogs are non-judgmental or are perceived that way. The book my dog has always wanted. Take a trip to your local bookstore and ask for the section on dog books. It's there. It's large. It's full of books about dog breeds, training, breeding, etc. Some of the titles you'll see are Do Dogs Have Feelings? Dogs for Dummies? Puppy's First Book? No Barking at the Table? Tales from the Bark Side? And the dog IQ test. Then I found it. The book my dog has always wanted. Healing the Canine Within. A dog's self-help companion or 10 stupid things dogs do to mess up their lives. Written by Max and Scooter. Some of the chapter titles in the self-help book are Break the Cycle of Passive Aggressive of passive aggressive chewing. Confront feelings of mixed breed inadequacy. Stop burying the past and digging it up again. Apply the principles of power sniffing. Avoid tennis ball dependency. Master the seven habits of a highly successful dog. I'm just waiting for the new onslaught of books to hit the market, like when the owner says, no, I feel guilty, when bad things happen to good dogs, and owner, owners are from Mars, dogs are called Pluto. Coming home. I remember coming home from the Navy after World War II. Home was so far out in the country that when we went hunting, we had to go toward town. We had moved there for my father's health when I was 13. We raised cattle and horses. This is how I got Teddy, a big black Scottish shepherd. Teddy was my dog and he would do anything for me. He waited for me to come home from school. He slept beside me. And when I whispered, he ran to me even if he was eating. At night, no one could get within half a mile without Teddy's permission. During those long summers in the fields, I would only see the family at night. I did not know how to leave him. How do you explain to someone who loves you that you are, that you are leaving him and will not be chasing woodchucks with him tomorrow as always? So coming home from the Navy that first time was something I can scarcely describe. The last bus stop was 14 miles from the farm, but I knew every step of the way. Suddenly, Teddy heard me and began his warning barking. Then I whistled, only once. The barking stopped. There was a yelp of recognition, and I knew that a big black form was hurtling toward me in the darkness. Almost immediately, he was there in my arms. To this day, that is the best way I can explain what I mean by coming home. What comes home to me now is the eloquence with which that unforgettable memory speaks to me of God. If my dog, without any explanation, would love me and run to take me back after all that time, would not my God? What's in a name? 
Parents take great care in the selection of a name for their son or daughter. So do dog owners. Chickens, sheep, cows, and goats aren't often given names, but if they are, it doesn't take as much time selecting a name for them compared to the family dog. Some families have had major conflicts choosing the perfect name, and some have even had to resort to drawing a name out of a hat to make the final selection. What does your dog's name signify? Who or what is your pooch named after? Why did you choose that particular name? There are popular names like Lassie, Snoopy, or Marmaduke, but they don't appear in the top listings. The top five dog names in the United States and England are for males, Max, Rocky, Lucky, Duke, and King. For females, Princess, Lady, Sandy, Sheila, and Ginger. Keeping in mind, these were the top five back in 1999. If you're around other dog owners long enough, you may end up thinking their dogs are named, no, stop that, or be quiet. Perhaps it's a good thing we don't know what our dogs would name us. I want to be close to you. Dogs are incurable busybodies. It's true. For one thing, they're eavesdroppers. They want to listen in on your conversations and they have to be able to hear the sounds of other animals. They listen everywhere, around corners, down staircases, under tables, at the door and near windows. They like to be involved in everything that's going on. They want to be let in on the latest gossip. It's a good thing they can't repeat what they hear us say. Or can they? We say things to them we wouldn't dare say in the presence of others. They certainly are aware of us making sounds to them or to another person. But I wonder what they think when we drone on and on into that piece of plastic we hold up to our ear. Sometimes you question their hearing ability when you give a command that's ignored, but then you realize it's still intact after you whisper words like food, let's eat, treat, get in the car, or a cat's in the yard. They come running out of nowhere. Dogs like to be able to see what's going on. They wanna know where you are and what you're doing. They love to watch you when you're eating. They follow each slight movement of the hand as you cut the food and then bring it to your mouth. And when you say, stop watching me, do you really expect them to stop? Some dogs follow you wherever you go. You walk into another room. In time, there's your dog checking everything out. You're in the bathtub and suddenly a wet black nose comes through the curtain sniffing, and then the head appears with an expression of, well, would you look at that? Can you stop him? Not really, he's just being a dog. Our pets accept us so readily for being the way we are. Perhaps we should do the same for them. Dogs teach us to take plenty of walks and naps, drink lots of water, don't think too much, never bite the hand that feeds you, bark when you feel like it, don't let people make you dress up, chase your tail, stop to smell the roses and the grass and the trees, make friends with everyone in the neighborhood, don't go for a run without your ID, Make people you love feel welcome when they come home. Wags to the rescue. Heroes come in many sizes. Their heroics are expressed in many ways. The response to help and save could come because of training, ingenuity, or even intuition. Sometimes we don't have an answer as to why dogs are heroic, but we have the results. 
A number of years ago, a group of dogs saved the children of Nome, Alaska from a deadly outbreak of diphtheria. Because of the severe January weather, an airborne delivery could not be made. An Anchorage doctor came up with the idea of sending a sled dog relay team from the nearest railroad stop, Nanona to Nome. They used 20 teams of Siberian Huskies, Malamutes, and their mushers. The dog teams kept on going through 60 below temperatures, hazardous ice flows, and zero visibility blizzards. Finally, the serum arrived. The dogs didn't know they had done anything heroic. They were just doing what they did best, pulling. What a wonderful example of helping others by just doing what came naturally to the very best of their ability. In London, England, a woman couldn't understand the strange behavior of her dog. He kept sniffing at the mole on her thigh. His persistent interest caused her husband to take her to the hospital. And it's a good thing he did. The mole was malignant. The early removal of it saved her life, thanks to her dog. Can your dog dial 911? That's exactly what an Irish setter named Lyric was trained to do. Her owner suffered from sleep apnea and asthma, a combination of conditions that could stop her breathing. Thus, she spends the night attached to an oxygen machine. One night, the machine failure triggered an alarm. Lyric knocked the handset off the phone and pawed preset keys to 911. When the dispatcher answered the dog, answered, the dog barked into the phone. This wasn't the first time Lyric went into action. Several weeks earlier, Lyric dialed for help when his owner went into cardiac arrest. Woody, a collie mix from Cleveland, Ohio, saved his mistress's fiance from drowning. Rayanne and her fiance Ray were walking in a forest preserve near a river when Ray said, He'd like to take a good picture of the river. He asked Rayanne to hold Woody while he searched out the proper vantage point. But a few minutes later, Woody began to pull away from Rayanne. The dog finally broke loose and ran off in the direction Ray had gone. Rayanne ran after him. When she reached the dog on the top of a nearby cliff, she saw Ray lying at the bottom of the cliff, 80 feet below, face down, in the shallow river. Woody jumped off the cliff and pulled Ray's face out of the water. By the time Rayanne reached the river, help had arrived. Woody had broken his hip in his leap off the cliff. Ray was also badly injured, but he was still alive. Thanks to Woody's courage, he became Ken L. Ration's dog hero of 1980. Beggar, a St. Bernard, became his three-year-old master's hero when the little boy wandered away from his home in California. After a search was mounted, Boy Scouts found little Bobby wandering with the dog a mile away from home. Both boy and dog were dripping wet. When Bobby took off his wet clothes, the imprints of huge teeth prints were obvious on his body. Bobby told his rescuers that he had fallen into a nearby, nearby river. Beggar had jumped in and picked him up with her mouth, then carried him safe, safely to shore. Tribute to a dog. The one absolutely unselfish friend that man can have in this selfish world. The one that never deserts him. The one that never proves ungrateful or treacherous is his dog. A man's dog stands by him in prosperity and in poverty, in health and in sickness. He will sleep on the cold ground where the wintry winds blow and the snow drives fiercely. If only he may be near his master's side. He will kiss the hand that has no food to offer. He will lick the wounds and the sores that come. 
an encounter with the roughness of the world. He guards the sleep of his pauper master as if he were a prince. When all other friends desert, he remains. When riches take wing and reputation falls to pieces, he is as consistent in his love as the sun in its journey through the heavens. Acquiring a dog may be the only opportunity a human ever has to choose a relative. Bishop Duane talks about his dog. I am quite sure he thinks that I am a god, since he is God on whom each one depends for life and all things that his bounty sends. My dear old dog, most constant of all friends, not quick to mind, but quicker far than I. To him whom God I know and own his eye, deep brown and liquid, watches for my nod. He is more patient underneath the rod than I when God his wise corrections sends. He looks love at me, deep as words e'er spake. And from me never crumb nor sup will take, but he wags thanks with his most vocal tail. And when some crashing noise wakes all his fear, he is content and quiet if I am near. Secure that my protection will prevail. So faithful, mindful, thankful, trustful, he. Tells me what I unto my God should be. In honor of dogs we have known. Some beautiful and moving tributes have been written about beloved dogs. Consider these. Here lies Dash, the favorite spaniel of Queen Victoria, by whose command this memorial was erected. He died on the 20th of December, 1840, in his ninth year. His attachment was without selfishness, his playfulness was without malice, his fidelity without deceit. Reader, if you would live beyond and die regretted, profit by the example of Dash. Only a dog. Epitaph from a tombstone in a pet cemetery. Only a dog, but such love he gave cannot have perished in the grave. So constant and faithful and true a heart must in eternity have some part. And sometimes I fancy when I've crossed life's sea, I'll find him waiting to welcome me. Lord Byron's Dog. A large monument was built at Newstead Abbey to honor Boatwin Lord by Bo Boatwin, sorry, Lord Byron's Newfoundland dog. Here is the inscription written by Byron himself. Near this spot are deposited the remains of one who possessed beauty without vanity, strength without insolence, courage without ferocity and all the virtues of man without his vices. I have sometimes thought of the final cause of dogs having such short lives, and I am quite satisfied it is in compassion to the human race. For if we suffer so much in losing a dog after an acquaintance of 10 or 12 years, what would it be if they were to live double that time? The Guest of the Maestro. What happens when a dog interrupts a concert? To answer that, come with me to a spring night in Lawrence, Kansas. Take your seat in Hawk Auditorium and behold the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. The oldest continually operating orchestra in the world. The greatest composers and conductors in history have directed this orchestra. 
It was playing in the days of Beethoven. Some of the musicians have been replaced. You watch as stately dressed Europeans take their seats on the stage. You listen as professionals carefully tune their instruments. The percussionist puts her ear to the kettle drum. A violinist plucks the nylon string. A clarinet player tightens the reed. And you sit a bit straighter as the lights dim and the tuning stops. The music is about to begin. The conductor, dressed in tails, strides onto the stage, springs onto the podium, and gestures for the orchestra to rise. You and 2,000 others applaud. The musicians take their seats, the maestro takes his position, and the audience holds its breath. There is a second of silence between lightning and thunder, and there is a second of silence between the raising of the baton and the explosion of the music. But when it falls, the heavens open, and you are delightfully drenched in the downpour of Beethoven's Third Symphony. Such was the power of that spring night in Lawrence, Kansas that hot spring night in Lawrence, Kansas. I mention the temperature so you'll understand why the doors were open. It was hot. Hawk Auditorium, a historic building, was not air conditioned. Combine bright stage lights with formal dress and furious music, and the result is a heated orchestra. Outside doors on each side of the stage were left open in case of a breeze. Enter stage right. The dog. A brown, generic, Kansas dog. Not a mean dog. Not a mad dog. Just a curious dog. He passes between the double basses and makes his way through the second violins and into the cellos. His tail wags and beat with the music. As the dog passes between the players, they look at him, look at each other, and continue with the next measure. The dog takes a liking to a certain cello. Perhaps it was the lateral passing of the bow. Maybe it was the eye-level view of the strings. Whatever it was, it caught the dog's attention, and he stopped and watched. The cellist wasn't sure what to do. He'd never played before a canine audience. And music schools don't teach you what dog slobber might do to the lacquer of a 16th century cello. But the dog did nothing but watch for a moment and then move on. Had he passed on through the orchestra, the music might have continued. Had he made his way across the stage into the motioning hands of the stagehand, the audience might have never noticed. But he didn't. He stayed, at home in the splendor, roaming through the meadow of music. He visited the woodwinds, turned his head at the trumpets, stepped between the flautists, and stopped by the side of the conductor. A Beethoven's Third Symphony came undone. The musicians laughed. The audience laughed. The dog looked up at the conductor and panted. And the conductor lowered his baton. The most historic orchestra in the world. One of the most moving pieces ever written. A night wrapped in glory, all brought to a stop by a wayward dog. The chuckles ceased as the conductor turned. What fury might erupt? The audience grew quiet as the maestro faced them. What fuse had been lit? The Polish German director looked at the crowd, looked down at the dog, then looked back at the people, raised his hands in a universal gesture. He shrugged. Everyone roared. He stepped off the podium and scratched the dog behind the ears. The tail wagged again. The maestro spoke to the dog. He spoke German, but the dog seemed to understand. 
The two visited for a few seconds before the maestro took his new friend by the collar and led him off the stage. You'd have thought the dog was Pavarotti, the way the people applauded. The conductor returned and the music began and Beethoven seemed none the worse for the whole experience. Can you find you and me in this picture? I can. Just call us Fido and consider God the maestro. Envision the moment when we will walk onto his stage. We won't deserve it. We will not have earned it. We may even surprise the musicians with our presence. The music will be like none we've ever heard. We'll stroll among the angels and listen as they sing. We'll gaze at heaven's lights and gasp as they shine. And we'll walk next to the maestro, stand by, and worship as he leads. This chapter reminds us of that moment. It challenges us to see the unseen and live for that event. It invites us to tune our ears to the song of the skies and long, long for the moment when we'll be at the maestro's side. He too will welcome and he too will speak, but he will not lead us away. He will invite us to remain forever his guests on his stage. Heaven goes by favor. If it went by merit, you would stay out and your dog would go in.